welcome arboreal friends. I understand you all must stay inside your castles and your palaces because the Grand Lord of the television has said no one is allowed outside. So instead, I would like you to magic yourself into the orangery of the Derby Arboretum with me. I'm all alone in the magic glass house. And every November, fantastical spirits gather and carry lights around the trees in the Derby Arboretum. But this year, all the spirits and all the lights are staying inside in so solidarity with you. And if you'll join me over the next hour, I'm going to introduce you to all the lights and all the fantastical spirits here in the orangery. And I'm also going to spirit you to the magical castles of friends, spirits and storytellers who have some secret magical things to say. But first, why is this called an orangery? Well, of course, some of you will have them in your palaces. They are big glass houses where people grow small orange trees. But this is a magical orangery. So in the orangery in the Derby Arboretum, oranges just appear by magic and only princes and princesses can see them. So if you see an orange, remember to shout out, there's an orange, so that everyone knows you're a very important person. Remember, only princes and princesses can see magical oranges. Let's have a look out of the window, if we can. Can you see all of the trees in the Derby Arboretum? Let's see if we can see them. It is very, very dark outside. But have you been to the Derby Arboretum? Have you seen all of the trees? Have you had a wander around? It is a magical, fantastical place. And I know a woman called Alison who knows all about the magical things that happen in Derby. All the little birds on a tree in her garden come and tell her all of the magical things. I think we should spirit ourselves over to Alison's castle and see if she'll tell us all about Abby, a girl who visited the Derby Arboretum recently for the very first time. So here comes Alison to tell you all about it. So Alison will tell us all about the magical story of Abby. Yeah, so this is the story called The Golden Cockerel's Big Surprise. cock a doo doo said a cockerel. What? A cockerel in the park and not in a farmyard, Abby thought. cock a doo doo said a cockerel again. A golden cockerel appeared standing tall, surrounded by four very excitable squirrels with tails in the air like feather dusters. <laughs> the squirrels chorused. <laughs> welcome, Ahem. welcome. We have not seen you here in such a long time. I think you were a child, a little one anyway. <laughs> You're still truly little now, the squirrels chorus together. Welcome back to Derby Arboretum. cock a doo doo, -doo. Ahem, ahem, the golden cockerel announced. Little squirrels, come, stand by me, brush tails, as you're making me dizzy with all this appearing here and there and everywhere. The golden cockerel said, almost drunk from all the action. The golden cockerel opened his wings and one by one hugged the little squirrels who, for once, were now stood still and alert. 
the golden cockerel began serious now, but full of wisdom, gravitas and elegance. Take a turn with me around the park, dear. Take a turn. He asked Abby well, more suggested it to her. Abby did not really know what the golden cockerel was talking about, but his long legs moved slowly forward. So Abby followed him and the squirrels started to get excited as their guided tour began. Let the light breeze massage your face, the golden cockerel said to Abby. His cockerel features raised heavenward as the wind appeared to dance through and around and on his feathers. And Abby's inquisitive face. As the cockerel walked, the lamps lit up and the light danced with the leaves and the breeze in the trees. The whole park was excited. How excited? Why excited? What was about to happen? Abby was excited because how often do you get to walk with a talking cockerel and a speedy squirrels and even lights that light up on cue? and trees, so many varieties of trees doing the shimmy. Wow, Abby thought. She didn't remember this the first time or any time she'd previously come to Darby Arboretum Park. Look up, the golden cockerel said. Look out, all the stars are twinkling here and there. I moved here and immediately felt free because we love each other here, he said, with a sense of pride. We look out for each other here, the squirrels chorus. <laughs> we all look out for each other here, the squirrels said, laughing and darting about again. Abby could not quite believe she was walking along with a big golden cockerel. As they approached the first of Darby Arboretum Park's furniture, the golden cockerel jumped into the fountain and started throwing water over himself. We must wash, dear, before we meet the king, the golden cockerel said, matter of fact like. What king, Abby said. Are we meeting a king? Abby said, both scared and even more excited. Do I need to wash too? Abby said. The words flowed from her mouth before her brain connected. No dear, you're fine as you are, the golden cockerel said. Abby smiled with relief. The king, dear, is the Florentine boar, he said. How rude to call the king a boar, Abby thought. Did you say the king is a boar? Abby asked confidently as she was getting used to, well, she was comfortable now with the golden cockerel's mannerisms. Oh no, dear, the golden cockerel laughed. No, the king is a boar, a male pig, but he's an especially important male pig. Yes, and he's got lots of stories to tell. Abby's heart burst with excitement. This day could not get any better for her and she could not understand why she'd left it so long to revisit Darby Arboretum Park. Do you think he'll tell me a story? Abby said eagerly. Maybe one today, but we wouldn't want to overdo things, wouldn't we? The golden cockerel said, trying to manage Abby's expectations. Then as quickly as it was to say that sentence, he dried off his wet feathers after, to tell you the truth, playing in the fountain. 
and started to preen his wings. The group continued to walk past more garden furniture, such as large urns and cast iron wooden benches until they came to a big object with its back to the group. The golden cockerel stopped and sounded the alarm. And in front of Abby's very eyes, an amazing animal got up, stretched, and then talked. Welcome, welcome, doodle doodle do. It's been a long time, the King Florentine boar said. Ah, Abby thought, that doodle doodle do. What a great name for a golden cockerel. <laughs> what a great name. Abby continued to be amused. Then she was right back in the moment, open mouthed and in awe of this amazing, a large talking male pig. And who are you? The boar asked, staring Abby directly in her eyes. Abby nervously stuttered over her words. Um, um, I am. This is dear, the golden cockerel interjected. And she's back for a visit after such a long time away. Ah, welcome, welcome, dear. Do you want a story? The Florentine boar said. So matter of fact like. Oh yes, Abby said, as she could not contain her excitement. And if you want to hear the rest of the story, come back later. That's an amazing story. And I'm sure we'd all love to know what happens to Abby uh, later on. So we'll come back and visit Alison and see if she'll be willing to tell us the rest of the story. But before we do, I want to introduce you to the big star, the chief star in the Arboretum Orangery. And that's just behind me. Can you see the very, very big star? And the big star asks, you can close your eyes and think about what makes you happy. And the chief star says, whatever makes you happy, you can think about it whenever you want. And that's the brilliant thing about thinking. But I can smell something. I can smell soup. And that's funny because Ben, a friend of ours at the Derby Arboretum, Every time uh, we have Luminate, every November, he comes and makes soup for us all. And it smells just like that soup. And it's coming from behind this wall of leaves. And this is where he normally serves the soup, which is a crazy, crazy thing. And I think it is probably very possible that we could magic our way to Ben the Superman to tell us all about his soup. Hello, Ben. Oh, and Ben, I don't think some of the magic is coming through. We can't hear your voice. I think you're on magical mute. Uh -huh. Is that better? Okay, good evening, yes, and thank you. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm Ben, and I'm not called Superman for nothing. Yes, I'm, uh, I'm in charge of the soup. After the people have toured the, the park in Luminate every year up until now, we end up back at the orangery and have some delicious soup on offer. Now, there are four, usually four types of soup. There's a tomato and a vegetable sort of out of the tin. And then the two of our members, Claire and, uh, and Maureen, make this delicious vegetable soup. In fact, Claire's soup is a vegan soup. So everybody can enjoy a nice cup of hot soup in a roll. So this year, because we can't offer that live, uh, hot, warm, calming soup, I've decided to tell you a little story about soup. Well, I've chosen three stories from around the world. They all follow a similar theme. In this one, we start off in our own country, in England. 
A tramp knocked at the farmhouse door. I can't let you in, for my husband is not at home, said the woman of the house. And I haven't a thing to offer you, she added. Her voice showed unmasked scorn for the man she held to be a beggar. Then you could make use of my soup stone, he replied, pulling from his pocket what appeared to be an ordinary stone. Soup stone, she said, suddenly showing interest in the tattered stranger. Oh, yes, he said. If I just had a pot full of water and a fire, I'd show you how it works. This stone and boiling water make the best soup you've ever eaten. Your husband would thank you for the good supper if you just let me put it, let me in and put my stone to use over your fire. The woman's suspicions yielded to her desire for an easy meal, and she opened the door. A pot of water was soon brought to a boil. The tramp dropped in his stone and tasted this, this watery gruel. It needs salt and a bit of barley, he said, and some butter too, if you can spare it. The woman obliged him by adding the requested ingredients. He tasted again. Much better, he said. But a good soup needs vegetables and potatoes. Are there none in your cellar? Oh, yes, she said, her enthusiasm for the miracle soup growing. And she quickly found a generous portion of potatoes, turnips, carrots, and beans. After the mixture had boiled a while, the man tasted it again. It's almost soup, he said. The stone has not failed us, but some chicken broth and chunks of meat would do it well. The woman, recognizing the truth of his claim, ran to the chicken yard, returning soon with a freshly slaughtered fowl. Soup, do your thing, she said, adding the chicken to the stew. When their noses told them that the soup was done, the woman dished up a healthy portion for her guest and for herself. They ate their fill, and thanks to the magic stone, there was still a modest bowlful left over for her husband's supper. My thanks for the use of your pot and your fire, said the tramp. As evening approached, he sensed that the husband soon would be arriving home. He fished his stone from the bottom of the pot licked it clean, and put it back into his pocket. Do come again, said the thankful woman. I will indeed, said the tramp, and disappeared into the woods. <laughs> oh, thank you, Ben. What a funny story. Let's see if you can see me properly. It's a very dark room, isn't it? And a very dark night. That's a little bit better. And I found myself a chair. But what a funny story. And would you fall for that trick? But I bet the soup was absolutely delicious. Now, I want to introduce you to a couple of friends of mine. I don't know if you can see them behind me. There's Mr. Al and Mrs. Al. Now, Mr. Al with the pointy ears is a little bit upset. And he's told me that Mrs. Al is not speaking to him. So Mrs. Al, why are you not speaking to Mr. Al? Because he's a twit. That's not very nice. What do you say to that, Mr. Al? Twit to you, too. Oh, I do hope they get over their differences. Um, they normally get on so well. And there's another couple we know uh, very well who um, designed the Derby Arboretum, and that's Mr. and Mrs. Loudon. Now, Mrs. Loudon, or Jane Loudon, um, has been spotted walking around the Arboretum with her nice hat and her shawl. And um, I'll tell you into a little secret um, as well. She can be found um, talking about uh, the, uh, all of the lovely things that she has written about, um, in particular, the mummy, um, which is a really unusual and special story that not many people know about. Now, she, I have spotted her about, um, so we'll see if we can magic our way over to Jane Loudon. I think I can feel her coming. Oh, hello, Mrs. Loudon. I think the magical mute thing is happening again. <laughs> oh, is that better? So, it's very chilly out there and I've come in to get warm. 
And I think that you were wanting to know something about my book. But let me tell you how I came to write it. I was very young, you know, only 17. But my story starts in 2137. That was 310 years into my future. And over, well over a century ahead of you, my friends. What an extraordinary story it was to write. I'd long wished to write a novel, but I could not determine what it was to be about. I couldn't bear anything commonplace, and I did not know what to do for a hero. Heroes are generally so much alike, so monotonous, so dreadfully insipid, so completely brothers of one race, with the family likeness so amazingly strong. This will not do for me, I thought I, as I sauntered listlessly down a shady lane one fine evening in June. I must have something new, something quite out of the beaten path. But what? Aye, that was the question. In vain did I rack my brains and in vain did I search for the storehouse of my memory. I could think no nothing that had not been thought of before. It's very strange, said I, as I walked faster as though I hoped the rapidity of my motion would stay, shake off the sluggishness of my imagination, but it was all in vain. I struck my forehead and called wit to my assistance, but that, that malign, malignant de deity was deaf to my entreaty. Surely, thought I, the deep mine of invention cannot be quite worked out. There must be some new ideas left if I could but find them, but to find them was the difficulty. Thus lost in meditation, I walked onwards until I reached the brow of a hill and a superb prospect burst upon me. A fertile valley, richly wooded, studded with sumptuous villas and romantic cottages and watered by a noble river that wound slowly its lazy course along spread beneath my feet. And lofty hills swelling to the skies, their summit lost in clouds, bounded the horizon. The sun was setting in all its splendor and its lingering rays gave those glowing tints and deep masses of shadow to the landscape that sometimes produce so magical an effect. It was quite a Claude Lorraine scene. And more fully to enjoy it, I entered a hayfield and seated myself upon a grassy bank. The day had been sultry and the evening breeze as it murmured through the foliage was cool and refreshing. It's a lovely world, thought I. Notwithstanding all that cynics can say against it, our own passions bring misery upon our heads and then we rail at the world though we only are in fault. Why should I seek to wander in the regions of fiction? Why not enjoy tranquilly the blessings heaven has bestowed upon me? I felt too indolent to answer my own question. A delicious stillness crept over my senses and the heaving chaos of my ideas was lulled to repose. A majestic oak stretched its gnarled arms in sullen dignity above my head. Myriads of busy insects buzzed around me. Woodbines and wild roses hanging from every hedge mingled their perfume with that of the new mown hay. I reclined languidly upon my grassy couch, listening to the indistinct hum of the distant village and feeling that delightful sense of exemption from care, which a faint murmur of bustle afar off gives to the weary spirit. When suddenly the bells struck up a joyous peal, cheerful notes now swelling loudly upon the ear and then sinking gently away with the retiring breeze. And then again returning with added sweetness, I listened with delight to their melody till their softness seemed to increase. The sounds became gradually fainter and fainter. The landscape faded from my sight. A soft languor crept over me. In short, I slept. Oh dear, poor Jane, she seems to have nodded off. Well, we'll come back to her. I'm sure, um, I'm sure she'll uh, revive and wake up uh, soon. We can always go back. 
Um, in the meantime, you can see behind me, uh, Mrs. and Mrs. Owl's, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Owl's children, and they've got lots and lots of children, as you can, as you can see. Let's see if we can get a bit more of them in uh, shot. There are a few more as well. They're playing in the background. You can't see, you can't see them all. But I want to know, why are um, Mr. and Mrs. Owl so grumpy? Well, it's because they can't go outside. Oh, I understand. You must not enjoy that too much too, either. But don't worry, soon we will be able to go outside and run around and climb trees very, very soon. Now, I wonder if a little bit of poetry will cheer us up. Now, luckily, I know a very, very good poet. And let's see if we can conjure up together the poet. And let's just see if he arrives and as if by magic. And here he is, Steve, the poet. Oh, I, you must. Hello, everybody. This is a poem called Two Brothers, and it's about two trees, two oak trees, which stood in a field close to my home over on Mackworth. And they've been there for the whole of my life, even though the houses are spreading and gradually getting nearer and nearer to them. Two brothers stand and cast their shade across the field where once we played. They watch us pass through childhood years upon that hilltop farmland where we lay and gazed at summer skies or laughing with friends cycled by. They stood in winter frost and snow, leafless and bare, they watched us grow into our teens with girlfriends as we pass along that quiet lane, our childhood gone. Our minds on study, work and more, and as the years passed, we saw new houses come to fill the fields. The water tower still stands tall upon that hilltop, as I recall, my family who once lived there. And though red brick houses spread across fields and land where once we trod, two brothers still stand to greet where Station Road and Radbourne meet. I hope that they survive the spreading of the town and I can take joy from spring's new leaves, the summer green and autumn brown, for they remind me to the last of those I loved who lived nearby. Two brothers watched us pass. Wow, what a lovely, lovely poem. Thank you very much for that. Um, now, um, I'd really like to know a bit more about Abby. She was having a magical time with the boar in the Derby Arboretum last time uh, we heard from uh, Alison. Let's see if we can conjure Alison back to tell us more about Abby. And I think I can feel her coming through and here she is, Alison. Hello. So, do you want a story? The Florentine bull said, matter of fact like. Oh yes, Abby said as she could not contain her excitement. She sat down ready to be entertained. The squirrels stopped dashing about and Doodle Doodle Do fell respectfully silent. The Florentine boar was chuffed that his friends still loved his stories. So he began, I could take you back to my father, the first Florentine boar who was fatally wounded during the Second World War. Or I could tell you about how I first came to Derby Arboretum in 2005. No, I am going to tell you about the beautiful trees and the love we have for each other. Once upon a time, some time long ago, in a fantastical park in Derby, there lived a number of beautiful trees, tulip trees, Turkish hazel, Caucasian wingnut, cucumber tree, 
magnolia tree, black walnut, and so much more. One night, the oak tree was caught up in the rich silence of sitting still, that this inspired harmonies of words to float down from heaven. And he thought, how old am I? The more he thought, the more he was confused. So the oak tree asked the other trees, how old am I? The words washed over its bowers where little squirrels hid and played. And as they played, the oak tree rewarded them with a plethora of acorn tidbits. Mmm, mmm. Nobody answered the oak tree's question, but the night smiled and the moon's smile kissed the oak tree's leaves, soaking them each with inspiration that generated the whole oak tree and trees with imagination and reminiscence. The other trees chattered amongst themselves and shared snapshots of their memories. Then the ash tree said, I saw you grow. I saw you grow every day as natural as the revelation of the world and just as dramatic. The Turkish hazel said, I saw you grow too. The black walnut and the cucumber joined in the story and said, we saw you grow too. And this, like us, is how you grew. The sun's annual light and heat drew internal rings inside you. In contrast to Saturn's external ones. You, like us, Eight sun, light, rain, and heat, and we've all piled on the pounds and extended our wooden girths to X, 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 extra large. All the trees laughed and saw their big wooden bellies had in fact grown with time. The ash tree said, look up at the skyline. That changed and has been as fickle as well, the British weather. But autumn, autumn, this season of change, our branches dropped burped umber leaves and twigs skydive through O2 onto dead wood that lay down like Sir Walter Raleigh's cape covering puddles. Your acorns, the cucumber tree said, is your inheritance, packaged tight, woolly hatted and green and brown face containers of potential scattered everywhere. You are so generous, our friend oak tree, that you share your acorns with furry tailed squirrels and vocal birds. But some acorns, mine the earth, cover themselves with a blanket of soil and sleep for a season or two until spring. How old am I? sang the oak tree as he started to recall people rich and poor, people, men, women and children <gasps> walking through the park each era in time exchanged harmonious sounds, squeals and songs and frequencies that danced through the cycles of seasons here. You are as old as you feel, chorus the trees, as the moon shined down and caressed century old oak in pure light and the fallen burnt umber leaves hugged at oak textured and wide girth. And the squirrels and the birds rested in the sturdy branches again. Thank you, 
trees? The oak tree laughed. Thank you, trees, for helping me to grow and for being here for me now. The end, said the Florentine boar. So, dear, can you see how we love each other here? Can you see it? Said the King Florentine boar. Oh, yes, Abby said. With sheer enthusiasm, Abby looked at Dougal Doodle Doo, who was silently crying with tears of joy. Abby threw her arms around her beautiful golden cockerel and the squirrels and even the King Florentine boar joined in a group embrace which had the power to drink in all the love, atmosphere and things of beauty that the park oozed. The end. Thank you. Wow, what a magical story. I bet um, Abby, where she had walked around the Arboretum years and years ago. I've got a little friend uh, here. Um, I don't actually know what her name is. I think it must be Juliet. I think I heard someone mention that her name was Juliet. Um, but anyway, she's sat on my lap. She's being very cute at the moment. But I can smell something. I can smell soup again. And it does smell like Ben soup. Um, so you must have a, uh, a special extra pot of soup going on. So shall we um, find out and see what Ben is cooking for us? More soup, I hope. Good evening again. Yes, here I am, Mr. Superman. <laughs> well, I hope you enjoyed my first little story from England. And now I've got another flavor of soup for you. This time it's from somewhere near Germany. It's uh, Germany towards Switzerland. And it's called The Clever Pilgrim. A number of years ago, a tramp was making his way through the country. He claimed to be a pious pilgrim on his way from Paderborn to the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. <clears throat> in Mulheim, he asked at the post tavern, how far is it to Jerusalem? He was told 700 hours. If you go by way of Mauchen, taking the footpath, then you will have save a quarter of an hour. So in order to save the quarter of an hour, he went by way of Mauchen. And that was not a bad thing. If you don't take advantage of little benefits, you will never get any large ones. You more often have the opportunity to save or to earn a batson, which is a small German coin, than a florin. But 15 batson make one florin. And if someone on a journey of 700 hours could save a quarter of an hour every five hours, how much would he save during the whole trip? Who wants to figure it out? <laughs> In any event, None of this was very interesting to our disguised pilgrim. He was pursuing only leisure and good food, so he really did not care at all where he was. As the old proverb says, a beggar can never take a wrong turn. It would be a bad village indeed if he couldn't recover more than that what he used up on his souls getting there, even if he were going barefoot. But still, our pilgrim didn't want to get back on the high road as soon as possible, where there were wealthy houses and good cooking. This rascal, unlike a genuine pilgrim, was not interested in common nourishment extended to him by a pious and sympathetic hound, but wanted to eat nothing but nourishing pebble soup. Whenever he came to a good tavern by the side of the road, for example, the, for example, the post house in Kruzingen, or the Vajostab in Schreiningen, he would go inside and ask, hungrily, humbly, and in God's name, for some water soup with pebbles, adding that he had no money. When the sympathetic waitress said to him, Pious pilgrim, the pebbles are going to lie hard in your belly, he said, Right, 
That's why I choose them. Pebbles last longer than bread, and it's a long way to Jerusalem. So if you could give me a little glass of wine with them in God's name, then of course I could digest them more easily. Then the waitress said, but pious pilgrim, such a soup can surely give you no strength. He answered, indeed, if you could use meat broth instead of water, it would, of course, be more nourishing. Then the waitress brought him such a soup, saying, the sops haven't softened up yet. He said, you are right, and the soup does seem to be quite thin. <laughs> Wouldn't you have a few forksfuls of vegetables or a, a little piece of meat or both? <laughs> this was... <clears throat> Then when the sympathetic waitress put some vegetables and meat into the dish, she said, God bless you. Now just give me some bread and I'll eat the soup. With that, he pulled back the sleeves of his pilgrim's robe and attacked the work with pleasure. And when he had consumed the last crumb, strand and drop of the bread, wine, meat, vegetables and meat broth, he said, Waitress, your soup has filled me up so much that I can't eat the wonderful pebbles. That is too bad, but do save them. When I return, I shall bring you a holy muscle from Ascalon or a rose from Jericho. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Ben. And that... Um... Uh, chap with the pebble he seems to travel around the world quite quite a bit I was just wondering do you have a pebble and do you think you could make soup with it now I want to show you a very special place you can't see it very well behind me but it's called the fountain of flowers and if you ever came into the Derby Arboretum you'd be able to see the fountain of flowers you'd see it all lit up and uh, in the uh, in the beautiful urn that sits in the, in the orangery it's beautiful and magical. And we can see it a little bit higher up as well. And what's so special about the fountain of flowers is that you can make a very, very special wish here. You can think of someone you know who's unhappy and then say to the fountain of flowers, I wish them peace. And the great thing about the fountain of flowers is that you can just think of the fountain of flowers anytime you want. Like the chief star said, that's the great thing about thinking. Now, I know someone who is very happy because he's got lots of flowers in his garden. Do you want to see some more magical flowers? So let's magic ourselves to Simon's garden and we can whisk our way into the magical garden of Simon, the gardener at the Derby Arboretum. Hello, everybody. Welcome to my secret garden. I'm the head gardener at Derby Arboretum's community garden. And um, I wanted to show you our special um, glowing flowers. Sadly, we aren't able to plant them in the Arboretum's community garden for this loom let me take you on a tour of our garden to have a look.
question that I need to put to you is, looking at our glowing flowers, is how does your garden glow that's an excellent question how does your garden <laughs> grow <laughs> and how does your community no, grow. garden grow <laughs> and how does magical <laughs> flowers grow thank you very much simon and they were really really beautiful flowers weren't they and i love magical flowers and uh, simon loves magical flowers and he looks after the derby arboretum flowers uh, for us as well now, I wonder if Mrs. Loudon has recovered from her walk. Um, maybe, she's, uh, maybe she's awake now. Let's see if we can call her. Mrs. Loudon, Mrs. Loudon, are you awake? Oh dear, I seem to have nodded off. Well, it would be no use to go to sleep without dreaming. And accordingly, I had scarcely closed my eyes when, methought, a spirit stood before me. His head was crowned with flowers his azure wings fluttered in the breeze and a light drapery like the fleecy vapour that hangs on the summit of a mountain floated round him. In his hand he held a scroll and his voice sounded as soft and sweet as the liquid melody of a nightingale. Take this, he said, smiling benignantly. It is the chronicle of a future age. Weave it into a story. It will so far gratify your wishes as to give you a hero totally different from any hero that ever appeared before. You hesitate, continued he, again smiling and regarding me earnestly. I read your thoughts. I can see you fear. You fear to sketch the scenes of which you are to write because you imagine they must be different from those with which you are acquainted. This is a natural distrust. The scenes will indeed be very different from those you now behold. The whole face of society will be changed. New governments will have arisen. Strange discoveries will be made and stranger modes of life adopted. The restless curiosity and research of man will have enabled him to lift the veil from much which is, to him at least, at present, a mystery. And his powers, both as regards mechanical agency and intellectual knowledge, will be greatly enlarged. But even then, in the plenitude of his acquirements, he will be made conscious of the infirmity of his nature and will be guilty of many absurdities which, in his less enlightened state, he would feel ashamed to commit. To no one but yourself has this vision been revealed. Do not fear to behold it. Though strange, it may be fully understood, for much will still remain to connect that future age with the present. The impulses and feelings of human creatures must, for the most part, be alike in all ages. Habits vary, but nature endures. 
and the same passions will be delineated, the same weaknesses ridiculed by Aristophanes, Plautus and Terence, as in after times were described by Shakespeare and Moliere, and as will be in the times of which you are to write by authors yet unknown. But you still hesitate. You object to that novelty of the illusions. It perplexes you. This is quite a new kind of delicacy as authors seldom trouble themselves to become acquainted with a subject before they begin to write upon it. However, since you are so very scrupulous, I will endeavour, if possible, to assist you. Look around. I did so, and I saw, as in a magic glass, the scenes and characters which I endeavoured to pass before the eyes of my reader. But now I can't remember all the story. We called it The Mummy. I think I must have written it quite well, you know, because it's still being read. You just need to search for my name. You'll find it. It looks something like this, I think, now, in your time. You, I did become quite well known, you know. I believe you've even given me a blue plaque near my family home in Kitwell in South Birmingham. And one for my home in Bayswater in London with my husband. That's about all the parks that we made in London. Fancy that. Well, I do feel quite tired now, you know. Where's that young woman gone? Where is she? Yes, I'm still here, Miss Loudon. <laughs> Thank you so much for talking to us. I really wish I could tell great stories like Mrs. Loudon and Alison. Um, maybe you can. Why don't you write a story about what you might find in the Derby Arboretum on your next visit? All you need is a bit of paper and a pen and you can start writing straight away. Isn't that great? I wonder if you'll dream about the Derby Arboretum tonight. Perhaps you can write about your dream tomorrow. And after all these adventures, I really am quite hungry. And luckily, on hand, I think there is still some more soup left in the pot. Now, we know where to find him, so let's ask Ben if he will serve us one last helping of soup. So if you can all imagine Superman, and it will bring Superman back to us. Hello, Superman. Hello, uh, Natalie. Uh, nice to be with you again. Uh, yeah, as I was saying earlier, I'm responsible for keeping the soup nice and warm, ready for when people get back from their tour around the Arboretum in the Lumin with the Luminate procession, where the people have enjoyed the dancing, the music, and, uh, and the parade itself with all the beautiful lanterns that have been made, especially for the parade. You can see them behind me now. So when they all return to the Orangery, I am there with my helpers, keeping up uh, keep nice and warm these beautiful soups. Now, I've already told you about two uh, soups earlier tonight, but uh, there is a third. And this time, it takes us to the United States of America. <clears throat> this one is called, <clears throat> not surprisingly, <clears throat> Stone Soup. <laughs> there lived not far from Gordonsville, which is Virginia, a widow who was noted for her niggardliness and extreme parsimony. So stingy and mean was she that a placard was nailed on her gate under her own direction, with the inscription, no soldier fed or housed here. The best foragers of the brigade met their match in the old woman and returned defeated from the field. At last she was left in undisturbed possession of her place and no hungry soldiers were 
ever fed at her table. But one day, a famished looking, lank, angular specimen of the genus Reb appeared at her farmhouse and knocked at her door. When the animated figure of war and famine combined stalked into her yard, the old lady was speechless with wrath. She opened the door, prepared for immediate hostilities, but the sad-faced defender of the soil was asking in a humble voice and with a deprecatory manner, please, ma'am, lend me your iron pot. Then I have no iron pot for you. This was snappily jerked out, with an evident determination was shown to shut the door in his face. Please, ma'am, I won't hurt it. You do not suppose, she began in angry tones, you do not suppose for one more, and I'm just going to lend you my pot to carry to camp, do you? If I were fool enough, I would never see it again. So don't think that you're going to get it. Go over there to Mrs. Hanger's. She'll lend you hers. One thing's certain, I won't. Mom, he still pleaded, I will bring your pot back. Hope I may die if I don't. If you don't believe me, I won't take it out of the yard, but we'll kindle the fire just here. Please, ma'am. What do you want with it? Asked the old woman, who was beginning to feel that she would be none the worse in pocket by granting the request. Might, on the contrary, be gainer in some way. I want to buy some stone soup, answered the soldier, looking pitifully at his question. Stone soup? What's down soup? The old lady's curious began to rise. How do you make it? What for? Ma'am, replied the mournful infantryman. Ever since the war began, the rations have become scarcer and scarcer. Until now, they have stopped entirely, and we uns have to live on stone soup to keep from starving. <laughs> stone soup, used the woman. I've never heard of it before. Must be something new, one of these newfangled things, cheap too. Well, how do you say you make it? Please, ma'am, you get a pot with some water and I will show you. We piles the stone. The ancient dam trotted off full of wonder and inquisitiveness to get the article. Yes, it was worth knowing the recipe, fully worth the use of the pot. Besides, she would make her dinner off that soup and save that much, so very much mollified, she returned and found the soldier had already kindled his fire. Placing the kettle over it, he waited for the water to boil. In the meanwhile, selecting a rock about the size of his head, which he washed clean and put in the pot, that he said to the old woman, who had been peering <clears throat> into the pot through her spectacles, Ma'am, please give me a little piece of bacon. That the size of your hand to give the soup a relish? The old lady trotted off and got it for him. Another five minutes passed. Is it done? She cried. It's most done, ma'am. But please, ma'am, give me half a head of cabbage just to make it taste right. Without a word, the cabbage was brought and ten minutes slipped away. Is it done by this time? She again she asked. Most done. With a brightening look, and then, as if a new idea had just occurred to him, please, ma'am, can't you give me a half dozen potatoes just to give it a nice flavor? Like, all right, appeared <coughs> said the widow, who by this time had become deeply absorbed in the operation. The potatoes followed the meat and the cabbage, and another ten minutes followed that. Isn't it done yet? It is to me that it's taking a long time cooking, she said, getting somewhat impatient. Most done, ma'am, most done, insinuating me. Just get a small handful of flour, a little pepper and some tomatoes, and we'll be all right then. The things were duly added from the widow's stores and bubbled in the pot for a while, then the soup was pronounced done and lifted from the fire. The soldier pulled Hatch's knife with spoon attachment and commenced to eat. He lost no time between mouthfuls, economical widow, hastened in and returned with a plate, which she filled. On tasting the first spoonful, she exclaimed, Hey man, this is nothing but common meat and vegetable soup. So it is, ma'am, responded the soldier after a while. 
but there was not a, a minute for, to spare for talking. So it is, ma'am, but we call it stone soup. The old lady carried the pot back into the house, but not before the man had emptied it. <clears throat> Learning for the first time how a soldier's ingenuity could compass anything and outwit even herself, she said, they have old Nick on their side. The tradition adds, she even kept that stone and swore by it. Gosh, I bet she did swear by it. A very magical spoon, uh, stone. <laughs> and you also need a spoon to eat soup as well. <laughs> Thank you very, very much, Ben. And gosh, now I feel quite full and a little bit sleepy. Um, I think I might take a nap. Thank you so much for your company. Um, if you saw any oranges, please do let us know in the comments below. And this is a very important job. If you saw any oranges, please do, do let us know because only princes and princesses can see them. And thank you very much for your help. And if you want to know what the spirits and the lights normally get up to on the park, when the grand lord of the television lets us go outside as normal, we put a few videos over the next hour for you to watch. You can watch them whilst I gently fall asleep. Bye bye now everyone, wishing you all happy thoughts and peace. Night night.